As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. Welcome to the Line Talk for the 30th of July, 2023. I missed you all last week. It was a uh, quite a nightmare weekend and uh, in the air. And uh, I had a series of like five one-night stays in different hotels, and one of which was an airport. And I don't think I need to say any more than that about um, what what my life was like. So it's good to be back with you and good to be together. And I'm excited to look at the passages for this. Can you believe that summers have gone? The 30th of July... And we have some, one of the most famous passages of Scripture that I'm not going to focus on completely. This is the Romans 8 passage, and especially Romans 8, 28, for God can work all things for the good of those who love him. doesn't mean all things are good, but God can wrench out of the worst the best. God can turn every trash can into a treasure chest, and that's it's a great passage, and and I was almost tempted to do that, but we are going to look at the message of Jesus in Matthew. <clears throat> the Genesis text, by the way, is the, the great story of of uh, Rachel and Leah. And um, I've never preached on that, and I'm not going to do it again. So <laughs> I passed that one by another time, but it, it's there before me in the future. So this is Matthew 13, 31 to 33, and then 44 to 52. All of our lectionary passages, we can jump around a bit and, and skip some verses. But I want you to hear Jesus tell uh, his message. This is now Jesus preaching and how he preaches. Notice, he put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of all shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, put on the good baskets, put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnaces of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this, Jesus asked. They answered, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Have you understood all this? And they answered, yes. Now, this, this is a, an incredible passage here. We've got this kind of shotgun, uh, machine gun, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. And what follows are metaphors, not just one sustained metaphor, but mixed metaphors. Yes, you heard me right. Jesus had no problem with mixed metaphors. Now, Paul didn't either. 
And one of the things I grew up learning is never mix your metaphors. Well, Jesus did and Paul did, so I feel free. And if you know any of my books, I feel free to mix metaphors. I have no problem mixing metaphors because Jesus said, and here's a classic case of it. One after the other, rapid fire, kingdom of heaven is like, new metaphor. Kingdom of heaven is like a metaphor. Now, these are technically called similes, but it's a, he, he's, he preaches to them. He did not speak to them except in about parables is a, is a technical name for stories. And every story is built on a metaphor. So you got you to gotta find out what is the metaphor, the root metaphor, which forms the nucleus of that of that story the reason why jesus does this and notice jesus is not your point guy let me give you these seven habits of highly effective discipleship that's not jesus jesus can have his like can have his like can have his like um we love points and and that's because we can turn verses into points but remember, the Bible is not written in verses. It's written in stories and poems and letters and songs. And, and the reason why Jesus communicates, not in words that we can turn into points, but in metaphors, which are at the root of stories that he tells, is the mind is made of metaphors. Your mind, my mind, is not made of words. The biggest discovery of psychodurolinguistics, cognitive science, cognitive studies, whatever you call it, the last 30 years they've been exploring the microcircuitry of the brain. They've been exploring inner space. As the first 30 years of my life, they explored outer space. But the biggest discovery is words are the last thing your brain comes up with. Your brain does not think in words, and you prove it when you dream. You dream in... Stories that are built around a metaphor. And so Jesus is doing soul surgery here. He's doing metaphor. He's, he's, we got the wrong metaphors. He's trying to give us the right metaphors that will bring healing. There are killer metaphors and there are healer, healing metaphors. And he's giving us the healing metaphors that, that we need. Metaphor is metamorphosis. And we have sold out and, and, Metaphors are more right brain than left brain. Now, God gave us a whole brain because God wants to live with both brains. But as Emma Gilchrist and others have pointed out for the last 500 years, we've been suffering under the tyranny of the left brain, the tyranny of the engineering mindset. Not the, or maybe, let me put it like this, the tyranny of the prose mindset, which is left brain rather than the poetry mindset. And we need both. We Why can't we live with both the poetry of the sun is going down and the science of the earth is turning. The highest form of conveying God and who God is, though, is not in words, points, facts, principles, or doctrines. But it's in images and stories and symbols it's both, truly, prose and poetry. But we have a, an allergic reaction in the modern world. We were temperamentally allergic to, to poetry. The, the sun is going down. That's, that's poetry. And, but the prose is true. The earth is turning, and that's the, that's the science. You know, it's interesting that they've been studying schizophrenia and the um, inability to think in metaphors, first pointed out in 1944, is one of the distinguishing characteristics of um, schizophrenia. The, the article, a collection of articles called Language and Thought in Schizophrenia. And people with schizophrenia have difficulty comprehending irony, metaphors, idioms, figurative expressions, and there's a general proneness to not handle very well the, the figurative meaning and to write to go after the literal one. Well, 
you, you know, it's got to be literal. Like what you just said, you know, you to save yourself, you you know, would you would you cut your arm off? You, you don't mean to cut your arm off. you it's it's a metaphor, um, and we have trouble. A sign of mental wellness and wholeness and healing is the ability to say, um, oh, to speak in metaphors and understand the power of metaphors and and um, to get metaphors. Now, and so hence I use metaphors. And my books are rich in metaphors. Some people hate it. Some people love it. Um, and um, I just keep going because this is how Jesus communicated. And I think this culture, the lingua franca of this digital culture is narrative and metaphor, which I combined into one word, narrow for. I started out with story and an image and it came out storage. So I tried again and came out with narrative and metaphor, narrow for. This is a culture, an iconomic culture that communicates in story and metaphor. And that's what, so it's very much like Jesus' day, the first century. This is the cultural currency. And so Jesus is giving them the insight into what the kingdom is in the, in the native tongue of his culture, which is the native tongue of our culture. So basically, we got to relearn to, to preach as Jesus preached, which is he did not speak to them except in stories. And every story is built on a, a metaphor. Now, the, the fascinating part here, and we can easily go over this and, and just not see it because it's so subtle here. But at the end of this, of this passage, this is, this is Jesus. Um, Have you understood all this? And they answered, yes. Well, no, this is, you know... Um, it is one of the, this is the disciples. Clearly, the disciples do not understand all this. But they're too clueless to admit and understand that they don't understand. And so they just, you know, I can actually hear Peter, the one that probably said it first. Oh, yeah, we get all this. Um, but metaphors and stories convey the deepest of, the, you know, explore and probe the deepest of the depths. And um, so we'll, we'll go in just a second. But have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And then Jesus could have just kind of hear the sigh. Oh, they still don't get it. Um, and he said to them, here it is. Every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven. Here's another. Here's the last like, last simile, which based on this metaphor. Every tribe, scribe, who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Now, he's talking to his disciples here. And these are, these are everyday people. I mean, he, he did not choose to have as his disciples rabbis and the best and the brightest. He went to the highways and byways and called, called everyday people from what they were doing, and said, follow me. But he's calling us to follow him. He is the rabbi. And we are called to become, did you get it, scribes. Now, you say, well, he was always fighting with the scribes. Yeah, but the scribes were the scholars. And he, it's not that he doesn't want us to become scholars. He doesn't want us to become learn, learners and, and to go deeper in our understanding, this hunger for knowledge. In fact, that's why the word for um, disciple is mathetes, M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S, mathetes, which literally means pupil, literally means student, literally means learner. Now, we translate it as follower, disciple, but it's equally translated. See, Jesus has created with his disciples, not just the 12, but you got other disciples with him as well, a lot of women disciples, a Jesus seminary. And if you follow, to follow him means to learn. Jesus himself said, learn from me. 
he put on his, the mantle of a mentor. He becomes the main mentor in understanding. And so we put on his mantle as we we learn as and we become scribes. Not not the nasty you know it all scribes, but the the know enough to know you don't know scribes. And masters of the story to become masters of of the Torah and what we are this mantle that we put on of our mentor and and, and what we seek is understanding understanding of what life what it means to be human what it means to live a fully integrated healthy, whole, human life. How to live life as God intended humans to live it. But there is no understanding without standing under. So we stand under, where that mantle of the mentor. We stand under to understand. It's the to- take that yoke upon me and learn of me. And so to be in this Jesus seminary, to be his disciple, follower, or student pupil is to be a lifelong learner that asks not how much do I know, but how much am I being stretched? How much am I learning? And the more you know, the more you know you don't know. If you get a PhD in biology, Ph.D. in psychology, Ph.D. in chemistry, Ph.D. in physics. The half-life of a scientific education is now six years. That means in six years, what you know today, half of which will be wrong. Not just mistaken, but wrong. That's how fast change is. Change is no longer incremental. It's exponential. The half-life of an engineering education is three years. The half-life of a computer education, what is it, 18 months at best? So that's why we've got to be lifelong learners and to be a student, to wear the mantle of our mentor, Jesus, is to constantly be learning and unlearning because you accumulate a lot of things that are no longer no longer true. And so you learn a living rather than earn a living. Now Marshall McLuhan was the first one. He wrote a 1967 article in Look Magazine. Some of you have no idea what Look Magazine is, and that's fine. Look and Life were kind of contenders. You had Life Magazine and Look Magazine. They both looked the same, and uh, it was hard to tell the difference. Um, but they fought like Pepsi and Coca-Cola. And he had an article, The Future of Education, the class of 1989. And this is is his whole point. The future. And he was so right. Because change is happening so fast. Change itself has changed and things are taking place. And I mean, when did you start using AI? I mean, AI just appeared on the scene when November of last year. And now we're all using it in some way or another, but we got to be careful how we use it. But look at how fast things are happening. I love Young Life has a chief learning officer. Every pastor, you need a chief learning officer. Either you be it or you assign somebody to be a dean of your Jesus Seminary and to be the chief learning officer, not chief learned one. No, learned means you've got a body of knowledge that you master, but no, you got to be constantly Learning, that's what it means to be a disciple. And this is so important because the hunger to know God, the hunger to know more about who God is and God's nature, is what fueled and fired the scientific pursuits. In the major figures in history, it was this sense of learning, this love of learning, and this quest for more learning. Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, Leibniz, Collins, these geniuses didn't boast comprehensions so much as were buffeted by apprehensions that led to deeper comprehensions. 
So do you wear the mantle of a mentor? I think in the future, everyone will be a mentor and will have a mentor. So who are you mentoring and who is your mentor? As you live with all of these apprehensions, what does this mean? What does that mean? Which drive you to comprehension. So the church, hear me. Jesus is calling the church here. You become scribes. You become scholars. You are a learning community. The church is a learning and unlearning community. And in those three things that Jesus did, preaching, teaching, and healing, that teaching component to be a teaching community is to be a learning community. Now, it ends here. This passage ends here on this incredible comparison, this metaphor of a householder, meaning the head of the household, which is the one that has control of the household, who goes into the storehouse. Now, that's the equivalent of our kind of attics and basements. They didn't have attics and basements then, but it's storehouses. But this is our attic and base and our cellar. And takes out what is old and what is new. Now, did you all hear this? In fact, I love just to put the two words together. Old, new. I I make it one word. I did that with ancient future. Ancient future, one word, back in the early 90s. And thankfully, Robert Weber, because I just threw it out there. I wasn't going to do anything with it. And he took it and ran with it and created this whole school of ancient future worship and and which is bringing out the old and the and the new and the point of bringing these two together the old and the new is to understand that tradition is not something we inherit from the past tradition is something we pass on and process in the present. In other words, tradition is a verb. Or as Paul elaborated the meaning of tradition in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, what I received from the Lord, I pass on to you. I was just in in England um, a little while ago, and I saw this sign it went to a high Anglican mass, Anglo Catholic, to be precise. But there was this uh, little announcement of a group meeting on the bulletin board, and the sign said, "Tradition is for the young." <laughs> now these were these were uh, young Catholics wanting the Latin mass, I assume. But um, it reminded me that you know I'm. Tradition is for the tradition is for the young, the old is for everybody. But there's it's amazing how the young seem to be discovering some of the tradition. I love the word trad. I'm a trad. I'm a traditional. I'm traditional in a neoclassical way. Um, I'm trad. I, I love tradition. But tradition is not something that you preserve. And I remember this is the Jesus's prime command, the prime directive, in, you know, God's prime directive in the garden. Um, I want you to tend the garden, but till it. Conserve what I've created, but cultivate it. He said, it's conserve, not preserve. You preserve pickles. Now you say, oh, you don't, you don't change it. No, you conserve. You, you, you live out of the past, not in the past. You live out of it, but you let the past take you into the future. And there's three important channels of tradition that were there for the ancient Israelis and uh, ancient Israel. And this is Jeremiah 18:18. 18, 18. This is the New Living Translation, in case you want to look it up. Then the people said, come on, let's plot a way to stop Jeremiah. And one of the ways was the gospel about him. Let's just spread rumors about him. And then, you know, if you spread rumors, they can ignore what he says because you've discredited him. There's a lot of that going on today. And then they say, after all, there will still be, notice, priests to guide us, wise men to advise us, 
and prophets to tell the story. And this is the three channels, primary channels of tradition. It's the priest, the, the pastors to guide us, and then there are the sages, the, to, the wise men to advise us, and then the prophets to always call us back. That's what prophets are doing. They're calling us back to the story so that we can move into the future. Um, now, there are some pa parts of the tradition that we, um, we, we may abandon for a while. And, I mean, for example, in some parts of the world, very few any longer, though, there is still a tradition of not washing clothes on the 28th of December. Why? It's the Feast of the Innocents. So why would you not wash clothes on the Feast of the Innocents? Well, because when Herod came looking for the firstborns to kill, if you had clothes hanging on the, out, out, on the lines outside or anywhere outside on trees, you'd give away that you had children in that household. So you kept secret the presence of your children and to honor the Feast of the Innocents. People didn't wash clothes on the 20th of December. Now, that's a beautiful tradition. But it's not really one that is so um, germane to the generations that, that we live in today. By the way, do you ever wonder why Jesus had a soft spot for children? Do you ever wonder why he, some of the harshest things he ever said to people that harmed any of these little ones? Because he, his birth cost many innocent lives as as they were killed in the, in the slaughter of the innocents. And I think that haunted Jesus all his life. Um, but we just need to do for our day what our ancestors did for their day. Not exactly what they did, but what, what they did. And we have a couple of story. I mean... And every day is going to be different. That's why learning is going to be different. And the things that we learn kind of come back. Um, and then they go away, and then they come back. And we get, retrieve them old out of the cellars and out of the attics. And, and that's kind of my role in some ways is I just go through the attic of church history and bring out things that we've forgotten and have gotten dusty and try and blow them off and re breathe new life into them and go into the cellars. I'm into attic renaissance and cellar revival. And, you know, we just get the, get the stuff that might be germane. And, and some of it is surprising. I mean, I, I was absolutely stunned, but not surprised, but stunned to learn that one of the hottest consultants today, and they can't find enough of them, are they're being hired by business, are etiquette consultants. Do you believe it? Because we got people now in work that have no sense of etiquette. I mean, they burp whenever they want. As soon as they get to work, they take off their shoes and go around barefoot all day. They put fish in the microwave. I mean, I could, uh, they, I could go on and on. Um, and I'm just, I'm cleaning it up here. But so, because a lot of them are good employees, they just have no sense of protocol or no etiquette. They're hiring. And they, they're hiring etiquette consultants to come in and teach these, these new employees. I mean, they've been raised by parents who have decided we're going to free range our kids. We're not going to say no to them. I, mean, I, I know parents that when they visit a home, they will first kind of uh, canvas and scout out the house for any things that might be not child-friendly. Like dog bowls, <laughs> like dog water dishes on the floor. And they will very unceremoniously and without any kind of fanfare, pick them up and put them up on the counters of homes that they're visiting in because they can't say no to their kids. They, they can't say, no, you don't go to the dog bowl. They'd rather not say no. And not have to say no to their children than to honor their guests by, by saying, when you go into somebody's house, you don't touch the things 
that are there that um, you shouldn't touch. I, I love free range um, parenting, but free range does not mean free reign. And we've confused free range. So these kids have never said, nobody's ever said no to them. No, you don't burp in public. Um, no, um, you don't put deodorant on when everybody's watching. I mean, uh, they, they have, they need, so they, now they need somebody to teach them. So hence, here's a new profession for you, etiquette consulting. Or... Let me give you another example. Just do for our day what our ancestors did for their day. I mean, Wesley, he was known for his field preaching and his street preaching. We, we fail to understand his street preaching was all about gathering. It, wherever he, he pre- preached on the streets, he would, first of all, they, they'd sing, like we prayer walk, well, they'd sing walk. They'd sing the streets. They'd get a bunch of Methodists in the 18th century would just go up and down the streets, and they'd sing, and, and sing, the, of course, the Wesley hymns, and and then they'd gather a crowd of people that they'd get to maybe join them in singing, or at least kind of find out what's going on, and then they'd pass out pamphlets and tracts. Wesley, this is the birth of mass literature and, and mass publication. In the 1790s, a book was the equivalent of one month's salary, and Wesley would be on the streets passing tracts, pamphlets, books out. No wonder people get, he gathered a crowd. Now, they would have the software of the scripture, but these because these tracts would be tracts on, on, on justification and sanctification. And, but th- this is the first time anybody ever held a tract. First time anybody ever received, and got a book, equivalent of one month's salary. And today, what are we doing? We're still handing out tracks. No, if we did for our day what Wesley did for his day, we'd be handing out iPads, iPhones, computers. Of course, they'd have spiritual religious software on them. But just do for our day what our ancestors did for their day. Old, new. One word. Old, new. Faith means we live life forward. We learn from the past but lean into the future. Jesus pushing us, pushes us from the past, but pulls us from the future into the future and beckons him to join us in what he is already doing. Um, Gregory of Nyssa insisted that faith goes from beginning to beginning for all eternity. Such a fast God always before us and leaving as we arrive. That's how Welsh poet priest R.S. Thomas puts it in his poem, Pilgrimage. We romance the dance and the glance of God's back, as Moses did on the mountain. So tell me, is your church more worn out from attending the death throes of the old than energized by the birth pangs of the new? that is being born out of the old. Irenaeus, more than once, you live from about 130 to 200. Jesus brought him, with him, a total newness. Jesus brought with him a total newness, new birth, new human, new creature, new life, new covenant. But the novelty of Christ is Jesus, of Christianity is Jesus himself. In fact, Jesus is another name for newness in all of life. And the one sitting on the throne said, Revelation 21, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down. What I tell you is trustworthy. And true. See, I am doing a new thing. How, how it springs up. Do you not perceive it? It springs up from the, from the ground, from the old, and it becomes new. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland, as Isaiah 43, 19. And 
and most of which is being postured now as new, is simply the reframing, reformatting, and rebooting of the old. Hence, we are in the old new business. What an incredible passage. As we, our faith, seeks understanding by standing under the mantle and wearing that mantle of a mentor as we join the Jesus Seminary. Will you? Have you? Will you call your church to join this Jesus Seminary that teaches us all how to be learners, scribes, scholars of the story.